Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk here. Uh, I would like to share with you some thoughts about cosmology and black holes, which I have been developing over the past several years. And this development is uh, listed in these archive numbers down here. Just a second. Okay, so cosmology presents us with many puzzles. Uh, why is the cosmological constant so small? Where do we get the energy to drive inflation? Uh, the black hole horizon, of course, we know gives the entropy of the hole, but what's the significance of the cosmological horizon? Uh, there are also recent difficulties with the Hubble constant values, not quite agreeing between low and high redshift observations. And of course, uh, underlying all this, we worry about what is the role of quantum gravity in cosmology. So what we are going to do in this talk is we're going to start from first principles uh, about quantum gravity and use what we have learned from the black hole information paradox. And we will find that a new picture emerges for cosmology. And this new picture has a bearing on all of these questions. So our conventional picture of the black hole says that the only relevant place where quantum gravity should matter is uh, at the Planck scale. So at long distances, we have normal semi-classical physics. And if you go below the Planck scale, you see all kinds of mess. The central point that we are going to argue for is that this is not correct. The vacuum of quantum gravity actually has a very different structure. And that structure is the following. If this is space-time, around every point and every time, you have virtual fluctuations of black hole states. So these are like a small black hole, a big black hole. So black hole microstates. Well, uh, in principle, you can of course have a quantum fluctuation of anything. It's just that if the fluctuation is of something large, you might think the fluctuation is highly suppressed. And indeed, if you think of the a virtual fluctuation of a solar mass black hole, uh, you might think such a state is very suppressed. But what happens is any one state of the whole will indeed be very suppressed and we will compute this suppression or estimate this suppression shortly. But the whole point with black holes is that they have another interesting feature, a very, very large entropy. So if you take the amount of suppression you expect for any one particular microstate of a solar mass black hole, but then multiply the probability for that fluctuation by the number of possible states of the solar mass black hole, given by e to the s Bekenstein, you will find the fluctuations order one and not suppressed. So that's the critical point that in fact, all at every point, the fluctuations of black hole microstates cannot be ignored. And this is the actual structure of the quantum gravity vacuum. And it turns out that to prove this particular feature of the vacuum, the input required is very small. The only input required is that one should accept that the full quantum gravity theory should satisfy causality to leading order, which means that at low energies, there should be only small corrections to effects which lie outside the light cone. Everything should basically propagate inside the light cone. There can be small violations, but nothing big. So just given this, one can make a chain of arguments going through the black hole information paradox and argue for this new picture of the quantum gravity vacuum. And then we will see with this new quantum gravity vacuum, all of the previous difficulties with cosmologies uh, might be solvable. So let's begin with the black hole information paradox and how that is actually resolved by the fuzzball paradigm, which has been developed over more than, more than two decades now by lots of people, some of whose names are listed down here. So what is the information paradox? Let's just review the paradox to start with. You have a black hole around which near the horizon, you create pairs of one inside, one outside. This is negative energy, this is positive energy. The positive energy member drifts out as Hawking radiation. The important state about, and the member falling in, lowers the mass of the black hole. The whole point about this, which creates a difficulty, is that these two members of the pair are in an entangled state. So an entangled state of two systems means you take state psi i for system one, tensor chi i for system two, but there are, it's not psi i tensor chi i, it's a sum over such things. And if there are n terms in the sum, then roughly speaking, the entanglement entropy of one system with the other is log n. So if you emit n, uh, entangled pairs from the black hole, the entanglement of the radiation with the hole 
becomes n times log two. So it just keeps rising all the way to the end point of evaporation, and then you get a problem. So some people had wondered if this problem could be resolved by making some small subtle corrections to the Hawking radiation so that you might delicately encode the you know, entanglement in all this large number of particles being produced. Uh, there may be only a small correction of order epsilon to each pair because we expect semi-classical physics at a large black hole horizon. But because the number of particles produced is so large, there might be some delicate correlations among them so that in the end, the entanglement graph comes down like the graph of a normal body. But in fact, the small correction theorem proved in 2009 shows that this cannot happen. If the correction to each pair is only order epsilon with epsilon much less than one, then it doesn't matter how many pairs you produce, the entanglement will actually just keep monotonically rising. You cannot sort of hide it in the large number of particles being produced. Okay, so what this tells you is that you want to solve the problem, you need order one corrections at the horizon, just as Malcolm was also saying, you might need to change things right at the horizon. Well, then the question is, how will such a change come? Where would we find it? Well, let's start with a string, with a string theory, which is at least a complete theory of quantum gravity. So it you know, either solves the problem or maybe it just falls down if it cannot solve the puzzle. So in string theory, you have to make a black hole by taking a bound state of the objects in the theory, which are strings and brains. And then you find that if you actually make a bound state of these objects, when you keep the coupling weak, you just get something of string size or plank size or whatever. But as you increase the coupling, the size of the bound state increases. And the size of the bound state is always of the order of the size of the horizon or a little larger. So in fact, you never get the picture you expect for a traditional hole where there is something of maybe plank size or string size in the middle, but then it's sort of vacuum all the way out to the horizon. So these structures that we get in string theory, whenever you try to make a bound state, you never actually end up creating the traditional picture of the black hole, at least in all the cases that we have tried over the last two and a half decades. So then this object is what we call a fuzzball. This is about 24 years old, this idea now. And so let's go and see what is the structure of a fuzzball. So we live in three space and one time dimension. So the black hole looks like this. And in here is where we were putting the negative energy particles and getting all the Hawking paradox. But for simplicity, let's just draw one space direction. And there here is the horizon. And here is the place where you would put a negative energy particle. Well then, in string theory, we have extra dimensions, six of them, but let's just think about one extra dimension in the shape of a circle. So now my space-like line has become like a drinking straw. And of course, extra dimensions have been there for a long time. And if you simply think that they should behave like under dimensional reduction the way we expect, then nothing really has changed because you still have this region where the, if you have a negative, a particle, it could have negative energy. However, with these extra dimensions, a completely new topology of the space-time is possible. You take the entire region which was inside the horizon domain and you throw it away. It's not part of space-time. And then you might think what happens as you come near this edge of space-time, do you just fall into nothing? And the answer is no, because the end of the straw is smoothly capped off like a drinking straw. And on this side, it's capped off as well. And you get a new geometry. And then you might say, what happened to all the mass M, which was in the center, which made the black hole? Well, that mass M is now carried by the curvature here with cost synergy. This is a very crude picture. Really what you get here are kaluza klein monopoles, which can be twisted positive and negative. But uh, crudely speaking, we have changed the geometry of space-time. So that space-time is not actually in the region inside the horizon. It's not a trivial tensor product of three plus one dimensions with a compact manifold. The compact manifold is non-trivially fibered over the non-compact dimensions. And that is roughly speaking the structure of all the fuzzballs that we know. So in more dimensions, you would cut off this middle region of space-time uh, and throw it away. And then as you come here from different directions, you would like close off in different ways. The different twists of the kaluza klein monopoles here in each of these Planck scale structures, you could think of those as uh, you know, the bits which give the all the e to the s Bekenstein structure uh, states of the black hole. So in fact, let's not draw this complication each time. We just draw this whole complicated thing like a ball uh, and just call it a fuzzball. And there's nothing, it's just like any planet or star now. So just to summarize, the information paradox seems to be resolved in string theory in this fuzzball paradigm in the following way. Every time we have tried to make a bound state of strings and brains, we never actually get 
a, a, a horizon, we actually get something more like a planet or a star and the structure of what we get in a very crude way I have just tried to explain here. For very simple black holes, like the two charge extremal black holes, all states have been made and they are first balls. For the black holes, a fraction of states have been made, but they all have this feature. So I'm going to assume from now on that the first ball paradigm is correct and that all states of black holes will ultimately be of this form. And let's see what they imply for the information paradox. So if we look at now the virtual fluctuations of fuzz balls, they are uh, very going to be very important in answering the following question. If we start with the star and let it collapse gravitationally, the semi-classical approximation seems to be valid at the horizon. So you think that by the equivalence principle working at every point on the horizon, the star just goes through its horizon radius and it goes in here. If that were true, the light cones here sort of turn inwards. And now as it uh, goes near the singularity, of course, anything might happen at the singularity, you might say, because curvatures are strong, we don't know what can happen. But whatever happens, the effect cannot propagate out because the light cones are pointing in. So unless you allow propagation uh, across, let's say, three kilometers outside the light cone, you can't affect the horizon again. And if you can't affect the horizon, then pairs will still be produced and you're still back in your information paradox. So how do we actually uh, get to actually making a fuzz ball? Why is the classical picture of collapse not correct? And how do we actually end up getting these fuzz balls dynamically? So when we make the states one by one as energy eigenstates, we find them to be fuzz balls. But if you put them together in a coherent packet or something to make time evolution, uh, what is the actual evolution you get by making a linear superposition of these energy eigenstates? In principle, all the information is in the energy eigenstates, but uh, how does it actually get out of there? Okay, so uh, let's try to answer that question. And the argument goes in the following way, the following picture emerges. If first balls exist as on-shell configurations describing the microstates of black holes, then the gravitational vacuum must also contain virtual fluctuations of the same objects. It's just like if you have electromagnetic theory, you can have a benzene ring or an atom or a benzene ring. Uh, let's start with something even simpler, electrons and positrons. If they can be virtual fluctuations, what about a positronium? Can there be a virtual fluctuation corresponding to a positronium? And you would have to say yes. And what about an atom? You'd again have to say yes. Maybe even something like a benzene ring. And again, you need to say yes. But of course, with a benzene ring, the probability of a virtual fluctuation would be quite small because a benzene ring is fairly heavy. And for a big black hole, it would be even smaller. But as we said before, the number of possible states of the black hole is very large and that can compensate the smallness of the probability of any one microstate to be a virtual fluctuation. And then the picture of the vacuum will become what we said at the start of this talk, you have virtual fluctuations at every point and uh, at every time uh, of different size black holes just occurring everywhere. We call these fluctuations vectors, which uh, as I'll explain later, stands for virtual. These are of course virtual fluctuations. They're extended because these are big objects. That's important. They're not point like, like electrons or positrons. It's going to be very important that these objects are also compression resistant. You can't compress or stretch them without an energy cost because that's what we find from the structure of these first balls. These are these complicated topological objects. You squeeze them, the energy rises, and you stretch them, the energy rises. So that's the property of these objects and the virtual objects share the same property. Okay. So let's see why are the fluctuations of large vectors not suppressed? The fluctuation to any large fuzzball type configuration is indeed highly suppressed. The probability will be like e to the minus an action and the action will be like the energy times the time. And if you work in little d space plus one time dimension, then the energy let's put equal to the mass and that in terms of the radius of the black hole looks like this. Okay, so that's the energy. The time scale is again put like the Schwarzschild radius r. So the action which is suppressing it uh, looks like this in d dimensions, d space dimensions. But as we said, the, num the entropy you should put, put in now. So the number of possibilities e to the s. And if you do that, you find exactly the same combination. So now you see that there is a possibility of canceling this versus this. And the large entropy of the black hole, which we always knew as a fact since uh, the times of Bekestein, we never quite knew what to do with it or what it implies physically. But now we see that it has a very interesting implication. The entire vacuum structure, instead of being only uh, having Planck scale structure and everything else being basically you know, smooth after that, there are actually virtual fluctuations of black holes, these black hole microstates around every point at every time, and they are not suppressed, however large a fluctuation you think about because of this cancellation.
Okay, let's also talk about how compression resistant they are. So if you take a fuzz ball of radius R and you squeeze it or stretch it by a factor of order unity, let's say to half its size or double its size, then several indirect arguments with fuzz balls suggest that the energy cost of that will be of the order of the mass of a black hole with that radius R. Well, it's not unnatural, that's the only scale in the problem, but let's accept that for now as something which we roughly see from what we know about fuzzballs and what we expect on general grounds. Okay. The virtual fluctuations just behave exactly the same way as the actual on-shell fuzzballs. So we will accept that the same, we'll uh, just assume the same property holds for those two. When I write an actual fuzzball, I call the radius R. If it's a virtual fuzzball, I call the radius RV. Okay, so now just to summarize what we have said so far, we get the following picture. We have all these virtual fluctuations around all or every place. So the vacuum now has looks more, not like let's say an Ising model away from the critical point where fluctuations happen only at you know one bit at a prime here or there. It's more like an Ising model near its critical point because near the critical point, there are big uh, regions which are fluctuating with all spins up or all spins down. And that's what what looks like Ising model near criticality. You'll have bubbles of all sizes uh, with uh, which are fluctuating everywhere. Or if you look at steam, which is inside about to form in water at the boiling point, at critical point, you have bubbles of all sizes around all points. So that I would argue is the actual structure of the quantum gravity vacuum. And this will now not only resolve the information puzzle for us, but also impact all the issues we talked about in cosmology. So what is the effect of this vector structure on the vacuum? So first look at some normal low curvature object like a star. Suppose this was a virtual fluctuation of vector in this room, but suppose now I put a star in there. A star has a weak gravitational pull around it. And so it will pull the vector in a little bit, the virtual fluctuation. The, it will compress a little bit the virtual fluctuation, which compression resistant. So after compressing maybe by a small fraction, it then stabilizes again. Okay, so the, the vacuum wave function distorts a little bit. All the vector part of the wave function will distort a little bit because of the gravitational field of the star, but nothing much happens. Uh, these effects are already included uh, in the effective action that we use, which is R root minus G, the effective Einstein action. But let's see if something interesting happens if we make a black hole. So this is the traditional picture of the black hole. You start with the dust ball, it collapses inside the horizon, then the light cones turn in, but once they are in, the guy has to keep compressing by causality, it all goes to the singularity. And out here at the horizon, it was going in. Of course, we had the equivalence principle, uh, so why shouldn't everything go in? That was always the central problem of the black hole information paradox. Okay, but now let's see what happens. Suppose this uh, dust ball goes in, and now think of a vector which was in this region, inside the black hole with radius of the order of the black hole radius. Now this vector is now going to feel the compression and the vector is going to be compressed. But if the vector is inside the horizon, then you see, if you look at a point on the surface of the vector, it has to keep compressing simply by causality. It doesn't have a choice because of this. So it keeps compressing and compressing and this time it cannot stabilize because inside a horizon by causality, everything has to go to the origin. So this vector wave function now has to distort by order unity, whatever structure I had of all these uh, topological things inside the vector, which were folding up in a particular way, they all get uh, severely crushed, not by a small fraction, but by order one. And the vacuum fluctuation of the vector now gets, because gets an order one distortion, the wave function of the vacuum, they become on-shell vectors. That's what this picture is showing. Just like when you change the vacuum wave function of scalar field modes, they become on-shell Hawking modes. That's just the scalar field fluctuations of a free field. But here we have the fluctuations of these enormous complicated topological configurations, but the idea is the same. If the wave function of those is forced to, de to deform by order one, and that happens because the formation of a closed trapped surface, it forces them to deform by order one and more, and then it becomes on-shell, and then you get the on-shell uh, formation of a fuzzball, and that's how the fuzzball is formed. And so you the reason you're able to beat the normal equivalence principle is that the virtual fluctuations themselves are extended. So the vacuum has extended fluctuations, and that is what is causing us to uh, be able to beat the equivalence principle argument and actually uh, get the fuzzballs to form and resolve the information puzzle. So I would uh, argue that if you look at this carefully and use the small correction theorem, which tells you that no small corrections can fix the problem, this is the only way to fix the problem if you believe that there are no large scale effects 
outside the light cone. Okay, so now let's see what this tells us with, about cosmology. So with a black hole, we had seen that vectors which are inside the horizon, uh, they get crushed and they are forced to uh, compress. Well, if you look at a cosmology, it's just a time reverse where you have anti-trapped surfaces, so things are forced to expand. So here are the, is my cosmological horizon, these dotted lines, where the light code starts pointing like this, and outside that, the light code points purely outside. So if there's a vector which is bigger than the horizon, you can see that if you look at a point on the surface of this vector, it has to keep expanding. So uh, we have exactly the opposite of what we have in the black hole. In the black hole, vectors inside the horizon had to keep compressing, but in cosmology, vectors outside the horizon had to keep expanding. Okay, so, and again, if you expand a vector uh, by a factor of order unity, the energy cost of that is of the order of the energy of a black hole with radius, whatever the radius of the vector is. So the energy we are going to get from this, we are seeing that any vector which are larger than the horizon will be forced to stretch just by causality. That stretching will create this energy and that will be the source of energy for all the effects we seek. As we said at the start of the talk, we seem to be requiring energy scales in cosmology, which we don't really understand why we're turning on a cosmological constant or inflation or all other kinds of things. But this will be the source of all the energies that we are talking about. But at this point, we notice an important difference between the Minkowski spacetime in which we talked about the black hole information paradox and the cosmological spacetime. In Minkowski space, we had vectors with all different radii from zero to infinity. And we needed that because if the vector's radius stopped at let's say 1 million miles, if you try to make a black hole with radius 10 million miles, again, you'd have the information paradox because the vectors of that radius are the ones that get crushed and become on-shell black holes, on-shell fuzzballs. But now you see in an expanding cosmology, all the extended structures, they cannot have too big a radius. The radius cannot be bigger than the distance that light has had to travel since the Big Bang. Because think of a simple example of the benzene ring again. We agree there can be virtual fluctuations of benzene rings in this room, but uh, because you know uh, that's a low energy configuration, so it, it must form. But if you go back to a time very close to the Big Bang, when uh, light hasn't had time to travel across the size of a benzene ring, let the size be saying six angstroms, suppose light only had time to travel through one angstrom, then at that time, benzene rings wouldn't have formed. After the universe becomes a little bigger, then they will form. Let's see what that means. Let's take a flat cosmology like this with the power law A is A naught T to the alpha. Here's the Hubble constant and H inverse is the Hubble radius. The distance that light has traveled from the Big Bang is given by this integral. So the maximum distance that two points can communicate is T over one minus alpha, where alpha is this power in the expansion rate. So the size of the vector RV must be less than equal to this R max. And so RV, if you, is good to compare just to the Hubble radius, which is the cosmological horizon, as a fraction of the horizon uh, is given by this power, uh, this function of alpha. So we can form vectors with all radii up to this value, but not larger than that in cosmology. And let's see what that means. This is the expression just copied from the previous slide. In the radiation phase of the universe, alpha is a half because we expand as t to the alpha. So we find this ratio is actually less than or equal to one. So in fact, the vectors cannot become larger than the cosmological horizon in the radiation phase of the universe. That is actually a good thing. It means there is no source of extra energy in the radiation phase. And that is a good thing because we have very tight constraints in the radiation phase because all of Big Bang nucleosynthesis happens there. Any extra energy there will lead to a different rate of expansion and actually change what we observe as the uh, relative ratio of protons to neutrons. And then from there, all the ratios of different elements. So that's good. Uh, we don't find any change in the radiation phase. In the dust phase, we find alpha is two thirds and then you find this ratio becomes two. So all the uh, vectors up to radius uh, twice the uh, horizon can form. And so all those with radius bigger than the horizon up to twice the horizon, they are the ones that will be forced to stretch. Okay, so, and now you can also compute if a radius at some time T naught had a radius which was uh, bigger than the horizon radius at that time, then just by uh, the fact light goes point outwards, it has to stretch up to a minimum radius, which is this. It has to become at least up to this R max before it can possibly shrink again. And here, all that is happening is it's outside the horizon. So it has to stretch. At some point, the horizon becomes even bigger. It comes inside the horizon and then it doesn't have to stretch. But you can see everything has to stretch some amount if it was outside the horizon. And this is the computation of how much it has to stretch. 
Okay, so then what happens when the radiation phase turns to the dust phase? At that point, you will get trapped in some uh, of these vectors will get trapped to be larger than the cosmological horizon, and they will contribute an energy the way have, we have been saying, but what is the scale of this energy? We said the scale of the energy is of the order of the mass of the black hole with radius the size of the vector. And if you just do the ordinary computations, uh, which we know about what is the energy scales in cosmology, in terms of energy densities, the Hubble square is G times the closure, closure density. And if you just take the radius of the vector to be order the radius of the cosmological horizon, you put the energy of that stretching to be of order a mass of the black hole with that horizon radius. Uh, and you put that the black hole relation here, you convert that to energy density, not uh, surprisingly, you find that the uh, answer is that if you stretch a vector by order unity, the energy density now, the energy is of the order of the mass of the black hole with that radius, the energy density is of the order of the closure energy density. So it's equal to row closure with the factor mu, which is of order one. Okay, but that's the order of energy density that we are looking for in all the cosmological questions that we mentioned at the start of this talk. So here, mu is a function of order unity and how much should it be? So this is the kind of picture we are talking about in the radiation phase. Now here is time and here's the Hubble constant. This is the radiation phase, this is the dust phase. T star is the crossover from radiation to dust. So in the beginning, the vectors had to be in the radiation phase, the vectors could not be larger than the horizon scale. In the dust phase, they could be. So the horizon radius changes in this way and the vector radius can then overshoot in this phase. If you just see how the vectors are to be modeled in terms of fuzz balls, and this is where the stretching is happening. And this is the extra energy we are talking about. So now the question is, what is mu? What fraction of this uh, uh, stretching energy do we actually expect? Now, if the changeover from radiation to dust were completely adiabatic, the vectors will simply adjust to the new cosmological horizon radius, not actually get stretched unnecessarily, and there'll be no extra energy. If the change was completely sudden, you'd actually overshoot by a large amount. Well, in reality, the change is not completely sudden or completely slow, adiabatic. It actually takes place over a few Hubble time scales. So you find that you expect a small fraction, maybe uh, a few a few percent of the energy of which you which, which of this energy scale. Uh, so mu should be uh, a small fraction, some number less than one, but not quite one. Okay, so with those rough uh, parameters, let's see if this implies anything that we might see in the sky. As we said at the start of the talk, there's an interesting fact that people have observed recently that at the uh, there is the Hubble constant values from early and late observations are not quite matching. Local objects suggest 74, while applied to the cosmic microwave band, uh, the Lambda CDM model suggests uh, 67. And one way to resolve this is that if, some, if there was some source of extra energy, about 10% of the closure density at T star, the change over from radiation to dust, it would actually resolve the problem. But then we see that's exactly the place and the scale of extra energy we were finding when the vectors uh, got stretched, when we changed over from radiation to dust, when the power loss changed from a half to two thirds. So we don't know if that's correct, but at least it's the right scale. And I think it's very interesting to look at these issues. Well, what about dark energy? We have seen that uh, the extra energy you get is a fraction of the closure energy density. So if, suppose you can get stuck in a phase where mu is actually equal to one. So this is the, the diagram again, we had got this overshoot and then suppose we stabilize to a place where the gap between this and this just becomes constant. So the extra energy of stretching, what is happening is the vectors are, are stretched. The stretching contributes an energy, but suppose that energy is just the right amount to maintain that expansion. That's what this picture, picture is showing you. The Hubble radius is this, the vector radius becomes this. And then because the vector radius is larger than the Hubble radius, there's an energy from that. And that energy is enough to maintain this expansion. So that mu is equal to one. Well, then you get a phase of the universe where these vectors are just giving you the source of dark energy and the universe is going into exponential expansion. Well, the same thing would also happen for the inflation phase. We saw that whenever you go from one rate of expansion to a slowdown, like when you go from radiation to dust, the vectors get overstretched and then you get, can get stuck in a phase where you get this extra source of energy. So this happens whenever the pressure drops suddenly, but this also happens at the end of the guts epoch can happen at the end of the guts epoch because the heavy guts particles all become non-relativistic and they freeze out. They no longer, no longer provide any pressure and only the light standard model particles provide pressure. So again, whenever the pressure drops suddenly, there's a change in the expansion rate. And then again, if the same thing happens, you get stuck in this phase 
uh, where the extra energy for coming from the stretching of vectors maintains the expansion rate, that is mu becomes order one, then you get an expansion, but now of the inflation kind with now the energy scale, which is fixed at the scale which you get at the gut zero. Okay, so that's the picture I was trying to present to you. Let me just make a summary. The traditional picture of the of quantum gravity vacuum is that there is nothing much interesting happening at large scales, but at the Planck scale, there is a lot of uh, interesting stuff because it's all happening, you know, all kind of bubbling may be going on and we don't know what they are. But this picture leads to the black hole information paradox. And the small correction theorem tells you that as long as you have no large scale uh, effects at low curvatures and low energies outside the light cone, something we'd all like to accept, you cannot resolve the information paradox. All small corrections are taken care of by the small correction theorem and there's nothing you can do. Well then string theory is actually giving us a solution because it actually showed us you don't make the normal black holes, you make these fuzzballs instead. And then when you start looking at what the dynamics of these fuzzballs, the Bekenstein entropy comes in a very interesting way and tells you that the whole picture of the gravitational vacuum of the quantum gravitational vacuum is completely different. You actually have virtual fluctuations of these vacuums at all stages. So it's more like you're at a critical point of the Ising model rather than at a point away from criticality. Away from criticality in the Ising model, there'll, there'll only be fluctuations at you know, one bit here or one bit here. But near criticality, there are big bubbles of you know, up spins and down spins everywhere, or like water bubbling to steam. And that is the picture of the quantum gravity vacuum. We saw that it's these fluctuations which resolve the puzzle as to how the equivalence principle uh, cannot then force you to have an information paradox. Uh, you need more than a small correction to resolve the puzzle. We saw that, and now you automatically get those in the fuzzball slash vector picture, which is being found in every calculation we have done with string theory. And in cosmology, we saw that uh, the reverse of the black hole happens, just like compression of the vectors generated the fuzzballs in uh, the black hole case. In cosmology, the, you get an anti-trap surface and you start getting uh, the expansion of vectors. And this time the dynamics is much more interesting because when you start with the Minkowski vacuum, you have these vectors of all sizes and you know that's how I solved the black hole puzzle for black holes of all sizes. But in cosmology, it's all dynamical. So the vectors are forming as the universe is expanding. And sometimes they are forming bigger than the horizon. Sometimes they get stuck to a size smaller than the horizon. And every time the power law changes, there's a different energy scale coming because of stretching or compression of vectors. And it's uh, interesting that the, that seems to match roughly with where we need extra energies in cosmology to solve the various puzzles coming up in cosmology. So for black holes, I feel that what we have learned from fuzzballs and uh, things like that is has to be the correct solution. There's just too much information now from string theory. We've been doing this for you know, 24 years and more, and there is just uh, seems to be no other solution to the puzzle. With cosmology, we can't be 100% certain, but I would say this looks like a really promising direction to look because it all looks quite logical and normal. Uh, I think if we make better models of these vectors, we might actually find that uh, these things fit quite well with what they're in cosmology. And this will give us a direct window to observe if all the things that we have been saying with fuzzballs and black holes in string theory are actually all correct. So it's amazing we can actually see fuzzball dynamics perhaps just by looking up in the sky, just making a more precise model of these vectors and just fitting it to what we are observing up there. So it's a beautiful interplay between black holes and cosmology, and I encourage everyone to take a look at this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the very nice talk. So the now session is open for questions or comments. Okay. Uh, Thomas, please. Yes, thanks. I have a, a basic question, a basic confusion about the black holes part of your talk. Yes. So the fuzzballs were introduced to avoid the, to have some structure at the horizon to avoid the paradox. Yes. Um, and if my, if I understood correctly, the Vecro idea is that um, semi-classical gravity um, is, is accurate. So my question is, um, if you jump into a black hole, does the horizon look smooth or not, and if it is smooth, aren't we back into the paradox? No, excellent question. Uh, so that's not quite what I was saying. So it's the difference between the, the vectors are the virtual fluctuations and the fuzzballs were the on-shell ones. So let me explain it in the following way. Like in this room right now, which let's say is in the vacuum, there are virtual fluctuations of electron positron pairs everywhere but that is all part of the vacuum wave functional. So I don't see them. I don't see them in the sense that if a, you know, a proton is moving like this right now in the room, 
it's not that its momentum would change, it will bounce off the electron positrons and scatter. It will actually keep going because the virtual fluctuations altogether make up the Lorentz invariant vacuum, so its momentum will be exactly conserved. But if I had some on-shell electrons and positrons excited in this room, of course the traveling proton will hit them and scatter and change its momentum. So the black hole was the on-shell fuzzball, and if I, uh, with the on-shell fuzzball, if I hit it, I will, you know, uh, hit the first ball, but the virtual fluctuations of first balls will not destroy the local Lorentz invariant structure here, just like virtual electron positrons don't create a problem, but uh, I mean, you still are in the vacuum, but the on shell electron positrons uh, you will scatter against. D does that answer at all what you were asking? Uh, well, partly, let's see. So, so then is the, so the quantum state of the fields near the horizon is the one that Hawking used or not? Absolutely. So for a, a actual black hole, on-shell black hole, it is absolutely not. So that's the point of the of the fuzzball paradigm that okay. with the normal uh, picture of the black hole or semi-classical picture, if you take a ball-shaped region, uh, let's say a one kilometer radius for a solar mass black hole, you would find something close to the vacuum in that region. And if you take a fuzzball and you try to look for the state there, you'll find something more like a planet or a star. The state there is nowhere near the vacuum. So it is more like you know a piece of coal or a planet. So uh, uh, for a fuzzball, you do not find the vacuum state over there. There is something completely different called fuzzball complementarity, which is sort of not relevant here. So I'm not talking about that, which is saying that if you have very high energy impacts with the black hole, you could make effective semi-classical behavior. But I'm putting that aside because we are really talking about Hawking pairs in everything to do with the information paradox of the page curve. So for low energy physics, which is what you're asking about, the physics at the energy of the Hawking pairs, you are absolutely nowhere near the vacuum. There's no approximation to semi-classical physics, box phi equals zero for an on-shell black hole. For the virtual fluctuations in this room, I'm saying there are vectors everywhere, just like there are electron positron pairs everywhere in this room right now, but box phi equal to zero is still true in this room right now. So that's why I'm distinguishing between the virtual and the on-shell. Okay, thank you. I think uh, there was a question from Jeff. Do you want to ask a question? Can I? Well, I can wait until after, into the, the discussion. Okay. Yeah, other questions? Okay. Uh, actually, I have a question. So the um, so. So I think that, uh, that this uh, vector is something, I mean, you said that this is a virtual version of the fuzzball. And so, so you have kind of uh, fuzzball and uh, anti-fuzzball at the same time. And do, do you see some, some uh, say for example, dipole? So uh, it it's not the like there are, yeah, no, that's a good question. It's not like there are two fuzzballs, but in some sense a fuzzball itself, you can think of as having a, object and an anti-object inside it. The way we think of fuzzballs from the very simple constructions we completely understand, the simplest way to think of a fuzzball is that you make a kaluza klein monopole and an anti kaluza klein monopole. So it's a monopole anti-monopole pair. So the okay. extra, you know, in a kaluza klein monopole, an extra compact circle in space-time gets non-trivially fibered around the center of the kaluza klein monopole. Though the metric is smooth everywhere. So if you have a virtual- very, very, very faster. Say again. They decay, they decay very quickly. They would decay very quickly. A monopole anti monopole pair would decay very quickly. What is happening is that if you make more complicated objects like this, which have more charges on them, you actually get objects that are very complicated and large in number. And then when they decay from one such state to the next lower such state, that decay is not very fast, but that decay is what releases the energy for this structure to radiate radiation. But there is nothing more. Non there's nothing new in gravity going on. They're just very complicated structures of string theory, which automatically exist in the theory. And when you try to make brown shirts of brains, these are what you find, you automatically get. You don't have to like say it has to be this. You find this when you do a calculation. Mm -hmm. And all these different kind of structures that I'm just saying, when you drop from one to the low energy one through a process of partial annihilation, the radiation coming out is the Hawking radiation. So in very simple cases that radiation has been explicitly computed, the rate for those very simple cases match exactly onto what the Hawking rate should be for those very simple cases. More complicated cases we can't do, but it gives us the picture that this is exactly what should be happening. You are annihilating these complicated topological structures to slightly lower energy topological structures 
and the extra energy is coming out as radiation. So it's radiating like any piece of coal or a planet, just going between energy states. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe we should uh, uh, discuss this in the uh, discussion session. But uh, uh, if you if there, there are other questions, uh, comments. Shinji, there is a question in the Q and A. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, Samuel, can you can you read the question in the Q and A, or is... shall I read? Uh, would that be in the chat or in the Q and A? Q and A. Yes. In the Q and A. Uh, it's the one by Bruno, or uh, anonymous attendee. Which one am I looking at? I think anonymous. Anonymous attendee. Yes. Is there some more robust calculation of the balance of the suppression and the number of microstates? What seems to have been shown was exponential of x minus y with x and y huge and x of order y. Absolutely good question. Uh, we did try to write one paper with per cross at some point where we tried to argue that the two exponentials were equal. It was based on some tunneling calculations of uh, shells out of black holes, which Cross and Wilczek had developed. It gave us an indirect argument that the two exponents were actually equal. But it's an indirect argument, and I do not actually know how to make a more precise one. So what I would say is I would love to see such an argument. In simple explicit cases, Yusuf Bina and his collaborators have actually worked out uh, uh, cases where they have taken fuzzballs and shown that the amplitude for tunneling from one fuzzball to the other uh, is compensated by the number of, of fuzzballs which come in that tunneling process. But those are subsets of the whole fuzzball configuration. So it's not actually answering this question, but this kind of what we call entropy enhanced tunneling has been observed in subfamilies of, uh, have been explicitly observed with string theory calculation in subfamilies of fuzzballs. Uh, but otherwise we only had one indirect argument to show the exponents were equal, but I would love to get a more precise argument. The only reason I believe this is because everything else seems to be ruled out. If I do not accept the fact that, if I, if I accept the fact that there are no large effects outside the light cone, then using the small correction theorem, I find there is no resolution to the information puzzle. I mean, everything goes in and then if nothing can come out of the light cone, the horizon will produce pairs and then there's nothing you can do. So I think that if this particular vacuum did not change in this particular way to, you know, uh, beat the equivalence principle at the horizon, I think everything now is now rigorously ruled out. So for me, that's a reason to believe this, but I would love to see a more precise calculation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, probably should move on.